Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, today, actually, we are having a very interesting uh, session, not only by the presentation or the topic that it will be discussed, but also by the presence of an eminent speaker. They can tackle this subject from different point of view, and you will have a very interesting discussions because we are having a very eminent speaker. Uh, and I am proud now to introduce my dear colleagues. Can you please share with me, yes, please. So today our uh, uh, session is going to be update management of epithelial defect in ocular surface disease. Uh, I'm Dr. Mohammed Al-Amri, and uh, I am proud also to introduce my dear friend and our teachers, uh, our pioneer speakers that we are proud to have him with us today, Dr. Isam al our well-known figure. He is an MD of ophthalmology, fellow Royal College of Ophthalmology, FRSO, I think London, and he is a uh, professor of ophthalmology and he's an ocular service disease consultant and also he is a uh, ocular plastic surgeon. Um, one of author and one of he is making and uh, also having written a book about ocular plasty that is well known also in the world. Uh, also, I want to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Osama Jlady, is a consultant of pulmologist, Morfield Eye Hospital, Dubai Healthcare, Dubai City, and he's a cornea cataract refractive surgeon. Uh, also, my dear friend, Dr. Safan Al Bayati, is an FRCS, uh, and he is a board of pulmology, and he's consultant of pulmologist and medical director of phaco refractive surgeon, cataract LASIK. Uh, Vitor Retinal in New Vision Center, Dubai Healthcare City, Dubai. Also, we are known might to introduce uh, the last, not the least, uh, Dr. Mazen uh, Sinjab. He is also a well known figure and he is uh, a dear friend. He is a paper refractive consultant, Dr. Suleiman Al Habib Hospital in Dubai. After we introduce our speakers, we can move just now to our agenda today. Can you show me the agenda, please? So the agenda of today, I will give a talk about introduction and overview, sorry, the role of relief total care and management of epithelial defect in ocular surface disease. Then we will have Dr. Isam al -Tawqi. He is going to talk about management of exposure keratopathy. Then my dear friend, Dr. Isam al he will talk about management of recurrent corneal erosion. And also Dr. Safan Al-Bayati, he is going to talk about how to prevent and manage persistent epithelial defect post PRK. And in the last and not the least, Dr. Mazen Sinjab, he will talk about matrix regeneration agent for persistent epithelial defect. So if you allow me, I will start giving my presentation. If you can stop share, thank you. Uh, so, Today is we are going to talk about subject that we are all the time talking about, uh, but today we are we want to highlight about certain points, and um, that we are all the time maybe forgotten to talk about, and we are going to talk it from a different uh, way or different uh, view of different speakers. Uh, my first question here in my presentation: Do we have an ideal tear substitute for dry eye management? Uh, if I ask Dr. Sopan, yes or no, do we have an ideal? And no. no. Uh, okay. as, uh, as an uh, special ideal, no. Okay, Usama. Okay, is there is Some are of, mute. Okay, unmute Dr. Usama. Okay, so if there is no answer only, so we'll take the first question from Dr. Sopan. So until now, we are not having an ideal uh, tear substitute for dry eye management from us, Dr. Sapon, he wanted to explain that, but maybe we can explain it now. Um, so all the companies now, they are trying, and during the last few decades, just to have the proper way of management. And every now and then we are finding that the dry eye disease, is still one of the most important disease that we are facing as an ophthalmologist, as a general or special ophthalmologist, and increasing. Um, so just a brief, I know all the, all the times we are, you are seeing this slide from a different uh, colleagues, uh, the dry eye syndrome, what is the dry? Dry eye is a multifactorial disease and it leads to potential have damage to the ocular surface is 
accompanied by increased osmolarity and inflammation. So we are having many factors that are working and making the dry eye syndrome, damaging of the epithelial cells, there is increased osmolarity, there is an inflammation, there is and also neural also problems that leads to an ocular surface disease or dry eye syndrome. So do we need to look for the cause of dry eye and does it affect our approach and management? This question for Sama. Yes or no, Sama? You are unmute. Mute yourself. Unmute yourself, please, Sam. Yes, it's definitely yes. Okay. So we have to look for the etiology. Otherwise, maybe we are... So even though we are going to use uh, the drops that we are usually are having different types, but now not only a drops can solve the problems. There is a lot of way that we can. And today also we are going to highlight this way. So etiological course, uh, classification, there is an aqueous tear. I know you know that, lipid deficiency, mucin deficiency, impaired eyelid function. So today we are going to hear Dr. Sam also to highlight about certain about this one and epitheliopathies. So there is a lot of things. So dry eye, uh, mean prevalence of dry eye disease now. The average age of dry eye patient is 54, mostly are women. I think this one is an old uh, mistake. I think nowadays you can find it even in the last few years, it even in the children's, even in the uh, below is in five, six, seven years because of the using of the high technologies iPhone, iPad, and so on. So I don't think this anymore is valid to say the average age of dry eye patient is 54, but still we are saying that. Dry eye syndrome affects 75% of people over the age 65. This is about 65, above 65. But how about those they are below? Now they are a lot. And especially after the, we are having the era of refractive surgery, many surgeries in the eye, cataract whatsoever, all of them, they are having an effect and some part in developing of or increasing the chance of having of dry eye. Uh, common reason for ophthalmologist visit, yes. I think we are all agreed that now, if no, not less than 70%, we can say most of the time we are saying 65%, most of our patients, they are attending our clinic, they will have some sort of dry eye. So the prevalence rate bringing from seven to 33%. I want just a small comment from Dr. Esan, if you hear me about the common reason of ophthalmologist visit. Of course, dry eye and refractive errors are the two most common reason for ophthalmologist visits. So Do you dry have eye any percentage, Dr. Esan, what is the percentage you think? No, I, I, I'm not sure about Usama. percentage, but dry eye comes second after refractive errors. Uh, Usama, in your For in me, your it's high. I think it's for me, it's almost 20%, 30%. 20? 20 to 30% of my patient. Because okay, I do so ocular what? surface, anterior surface, so I had a lot of my patient. Yeah, so uh, same as Usama, maybe yeah, it's up to 30%. But uh, that's the, 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 the percentage that we are facing in our uh, clinic. I don't know. I, we, if you ask me, we are having more. I think everyone attending the clinic, he is having a, some sort of dry eye. But maybe some of them, they are not complaining. But when you are examining, you will find some of them. There is a lot. I mean, nowadays of people, they are suffering of dry eye. Anyway, dry affect the vision, yes, in different way or others. We are having a night driving, it's most commonly reading its effect. There is a computer can cause and watching TV. So this is a dry eye affect vision in this way. So the other question, is there any connection between dry eye and refractive surgery? I think so one, you will answer. The, for sure, absolutely. That it's, it's very important connection because the first issue is that when we are uh, screening for uh, eligibility for the refractive surgery, we are screening for the dry eye. Patient with a dry eye, they are not eligible now for any, okay. it's, a, it's apart from the refractive, for any surgery. So dry eye is the most common complication of LASIK. Virtually all patients experience dry eyes after LASIK. Six months after LASIK, approximately 20% of the patients continue to report dry eyes. Other studies demonstrate that 30% to 50% even percent of LASIK patients 
experience chronic dry eye persisting beyond one year after the surgery. We can discuss this later on if there is any comment about that or the presenting. What are the main principal goals in dry eye treatments? So our principle of treatments, we are treating the symptoms, we are treating the cause and treat the complications that result from the dry eye. This is how the lubrication uh, is due. It's a symptoms relief. So we need a lubrication to do a symptoms relief, improve the quality of life, and or we can say the vision, ocular service health. We need an ocular service that healthy so we are not suffering of any complication or any comment or any, 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 any annoying symptoms for the eye. So if we are talking about the lubricants here in the triangle, we have osmolarity. We have to do, uh, this is the ideal in, in one way, to do that three, the osmolarity should be a preservative free and we have to a supplement of electrolyte. So if we have that one, we can have a clarity, no blurry, then we will have stability lasting the effect. So stability, then we have to have a lubricating eye drop that have lasting effect and few, fewer applications. Uh, today, we I'm going to introduce for you a new drugs that is now will be launched in UAE. Maybe it's not a drugs, new drugs uh, in Europe or in Spain where it uh, came. And this uh, drugs is produced by Salve. So uh, relief to total care. This is a new drops. It will be launched here. And this one is do a re and UV protection eye drops. Active in ingredients, this one are very important, active in quinolone, uh, cyanocobalamin, which is vitamin B12, and the BVP. So relieve a uh, total care, why it's very important and something new that we know every now and then we, we need to have and to get a new product that it will facilitate our work and support our treatments in treating the dry eye and the dry uh, disease. Uh, so we are having vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is facilitate revitalization properties, promote revitalization. If we are having actinoquinone and vitamin B12, it's lead to UV protection in especially sensitive patients, surgery, dry eye, and extra. And if we have also the material BV, BVP, lubricating effect, adequate lubricating. So, if we want to see how the effect of relief total care, we can find that revitalization activity, it happens in one way. Effect of relief total care in cell migrating in vitro study compared to a control saline or sodium hyaluronate actinoquinone in one healing state. You can see here in the center, you will find the relief total care, how the revitalization is more when we are using relief in comparison to another drugs they comparing in the study. <clears throat> this is an abstract uh, talking about the effect of actinoquinone with hyaluronic acid in eye drops on the optical uh, properties and oxidative damage of the rabbit cornea irradiated with UVB dry eyes. So after from this abstract, if you go directly to the conclusions, inclusion in the end, actinoquinone hyaluronic acid eye drops detect uh, decrease, sorry, changes in the corneal optics and suppress oxidative damage in the UV irradiation cornea. So the presence of this material in relief to that, it may lead to a protection from the UV effect and irradiations of the cornea. So here, and again, you can see the relief total has a greater revitalizing activity, wound healing in fibroplasts than hyaluronic acid plus actinoquinone. <clears throat> this is again here, you can see the, the staining in the cornea, or if you will find when we are using the relief in the last one in the right side of the, your hands, you can see the relief total care here, and you can see how the effect is more in decreasing on making the revitalization rather than other drugs control or hyaluronic acid and actinoquinone. And in case of protecting against UV radiations, you can see that here the relief total care has a longer than what is in uh, actinoquinone alone or hyaluronic acid and actinoquinone. 
it take more longer than it will take cover more the wave that can protect against the UV radiations. <clears throat> so in brief, we can say now relief total care, which is now is going to be uh, uh, launched here and available now is a 20 single dose vials. Um, and when relief total care is needed, corneal revitalization or surgery, lubricating and UV protections, uh, it can be used in one to two drops, three to four times per day. Uh, I would like to thank you for listening. And if there is any comment or questions, I'm ready for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed, very much. Uh, regarding dilating about refractive surgery, it's causing dry eye, but that figure is too, too high. After a year, really, the, after a year, I expected like maybe one or two percent, they may have longer dry eye, but to have like 30 percent after a year, that's really, that's, uh, I, I'm not yeah. aware of that, that extreme. Yeah, a little bit exaggerated figure. Uh, anyway, I think it's, it's taken much. from the uh, one of the study is showing this one. It's not, not my personal, but anyway, I, I, I was asking you because uh, I feel it is well, a little high, but you are the expert yes. in refractive yeah. surgery and you can give more. I think, yeah, we I think it's one good. time we do yeah. some about this one, yes. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, uh, yes, you Dr. started, Sam. you started, you started the, your presentation by a very good question. Is there an ideal eye drops uh, for lubrication that can replace tears? And uh, let me tell you, there will never be an ideal eye drops that replace tears because tears are not constant. They don't have a constant composition. The composition of tears, the amount of electrolytes, of uh, uh, interferon, uh, antibodies, whatever is in the tears changes, changes over the day, changes over the uh, weather. So you, you can never have uh, a changing eye drops. So nothing will, will ever be ideal to replace our totally changing tears. Uh, thank you. The closest Khan. one is the yeah, plasma, maybe, think, by the way. The, the closest one is the plasma. Near to that. Sorry, yeah. Dr. Sama. The closest one is a natural plasma, maybe. That's the closest one. Yes, uh, but I mean... Uh, what is the company is trying you know we are seeing a lot of eye drops is coming in the market every now and then and every now and then we are getting an improvement in the type of, uh, of uh, yeah. eye drops that treating the dry eye before we don't have anything to treat the inflammation now the inflammation as we know and we can see there is um, two or three uh, products available mm -hmm. that can uh, deal with inflammations I think, Dr. Isam, you will talk about neurological things related. I think there is also a talks about how to manage this one. Uh, protection, revitalization, one of the most important also things to be. Uh, so as you mentioned, there will be no one ideal, but we yeah. can come closer and closer as much we, as we can. And this is what we, the options we are having. In addition to other methods of treatments that we are going to talk now. Uh, is there any comment before we move to another uh, talks? Usama, Safan. No. So well, that's very good. That's very good. Yeah. So now we will move to dear uh, uh, teachers, dear friends, Professor Dr. Assam, uh, to give his uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, it's always a pleasure and uh, an honor uh, to share uh, in such activities uh, with uh, yourself and all uh, the distinguished colleagues. Uh, I will speak about the surgical management of corneal exposure, uh, because we all know that corneal exposure is, is a leading or an important cause for uh, ocular surface disease dis uh, disorders. Uh, uh, the, the photos uh, are taken from uh, the book which belongs to Springer and I have to mention that. Uh, when do we need surgical management of uh, uh, ocular surface disease? Uh, it's not the first line of treatment. It's only indicated either after failure of the medical measures that will be discussed later and 
that Dr. Muhammad uh, touched base with, or prophylactically, actually, in some high-risk cases that we know that they can end up in corneal ulceration, perforation, or opacification. So usually it's curative, sometimes it's preventive to start surgical management of the corneal exposure. We have several options. We have the botulinum toxin injection, the uh, molar levator muscle uh, surgeries, the uh, gold weight implants in the upper lid, and finally, we have the corneal neurotization. And I will go through each one of these quickly, discussing the advantages, the indications, and when to do it. Uh, botulinum to toxin injection is in indicated uh, nowadays as a prophylactic measure with major neurosurgical procedures. A lot of neurosurgical procedures are followed by uh, temporary facial nerve palsy, sometimes brain edema and trigeminal nerve affection, sometimes uh, coma that will last for a few days. So we know that this patient will uh, need corneal protection. So we prophylactically can inject them after major neurosurgical procedures. And we have been doing this in our university hospital for several years now. And this has improved a lot the outcome of these patients. Similarly, patients who are on prolonged coma, for whatever reason, we all know that this patient requires uh, uh, to take care of the cornea, and instead of the old tarsography, Botox injection in the levator muscle has served us a, a great advantage. We also use Botox uh, in corneal exposure when, when we know that recovery will happen in a few weeks or in a few months, such as acute Bell's palsy, for example. We know that Bell's palsy, most of the time, the patient will recover during the area of the, the timing of the disease. We don't want the cornea to be affected, so we uh, use Botox as a prophylactic measure. We usually inject three uh, locations, the medial part, the central part, and the lateral part of the levator muscle in the middle of the lid, actually in just above the crease. We inject 2.5 units in each of these three locations, so a, a total amount of 7.5 units. This procedure is very simple. It's available everywhere. It is reversible, so we know it, it, it will not last like tarsography, for example. Uh, it can be repeated if needed. Sometimes uh, the recovery of Bell's palsy takes longer time. We can add a little bit of more Botox, so we can repeat it until we don't need it. And actually, uh, the injection of Botox uh, starts at a high level. It reached the maximum effect in three or four days. And then gradually, the effect starts to uh, get lost gradually. And this occurs hand in hand with the recovery. The recovery starts from low and increases a bit uh, gradually. So they both go with each other. The loss of the Botox effect becomes uh, uh, more. The recovery becomes more. And so this is a very ideal, until the patient is totally recovered, the, the whole uh, effect of Botox has gone. So this is a very ideal situation instead of the old uh, fashioned tarsography that we used to do before. The other is to work on the elevator and molar muscle, the other option. And when do we need to work on the elevator and molar muscle in cases of corneal exposure? We do this when the lid the level of the upper lid is higher than normal. Like in cases of thyroid, for example, post blepharoplasty, post trauma, or sometimes even which we see uh, many times in Egypt and, and in the Middle East, after multiple lid surgeries that results in a small or a deformed tarsus that is unable to maintain the integrity of the lid. In these cases, the upper lid is actually retracted up. This is a, the best indication for recessing the retractors, which are molar muscle and the levator. What uh, my, my uh, preferred technique is to do this transconjunctivally under local anesthesia, to do it graded. So we, we recess, we make the patient sit up, we see the level and we either recess again or stop depending on the level that we need. And we do it 
with the carbon dioxide laser if available, but at least with the radio frequency, so there is much less damage to the tissues. This is the best approach if the upper eyelid is high than normal, like in cases like this, which, which, which is a thyroid, a classical case of thyroid. Again, another one before and after. When the lid is higher, you lower the lid. In some cases, the lid is in normal position or even low position, and yet the cornea is exposed. This occurs in cases of myopathies, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, uh, old Bell's palsy. In these cases, recession of the levator or molar muscle will actually obliterate the visual field. It's not indicated in these cases. When the upper lid is a normal position or is lower in position, we insert gold weights in the upper lid. Why? Because in the primary position with the contraction of the elevator, the visual field is, is still maintained. But with the relaxation of the elevator and the effect of gravity by the gold weight, the cornea will be protected. So you are not losing your field and you're still protecting the cornea. Another major advantage is during sleep. We all know that gold weight works by gravity, by the weight itself. This works well with the patient in the sitting or standing position. When the patient is going to bed, which is the time that the cornea is more in danger, actually the gold weight does not work. The patient is like down. There's no effect of gravity on the gold weight. So we have to train the patient that when he goes to bed with his finger, with his hand, he pulls the gold weight down to close the eyelid. And this simple maneuver works well and really protects the cornea. Without the single maneuver, the effect of the gold weight loses its main value during sleep or at bedtime. Again, gold weight implantation is a simple procedure. It's done under local anesthesia. It works immediately. The minute you insert the, the gold weight, the minute the lid can go down and protect the cornea. And if needed, it can be removed. This is, uh, I'm sure you all know, this is the gold weight. This is how it is placed and fixated to the anterior surface of the tarsus. And these are a few cases. Here, as you can see preoperatively, the lid is in a normal position, yet there is exposure. When you insert the, lid, the gold weight immediately on table, while still the wound is, is not even healed, the exposure has gone. So gold weight implant is indicated in cases of corneal exposure with normal or low upper lid level. Another case, the, the facial palsy is clear. The eye does not close, but the lid is in a normal position. It's not retracted. The minute you insert the gold weight on table, the lid starts to close while looking down and with relaxation of the elevator. What, are, what is the role of the lower lid in corneal exposure? Actually, the lower lid, even physiologically in normal patient, does not have a major uh, uh, role in corneal protection. The lower lid ends or starts at the lower limbus. So it, it has no real role in covering the cornea. However, the only indication for lower lid surgery in corneal exposure, if there is an associated lid malposition. If there is an associated lid malposition, correct it. But to work on the lower lid, trying to attain corneal protection, this is actually against even the normal physiology. So in such cases, if the lower lid has a, a malposition, you correct the malposition. Then the condition will improve, but don't, start by working on the lower lid. It, it, it will be of very minimal value. Finally, if there is an association between corneal exposure and decreased corneal sensation, then the danger is much, much higher. This happens in cases of neurosurgical procedures if the facial and trigeminal nerve are affected, stroke, which happens a lot with the prolonged life expectancy that we have, even now, now we're having uh, an epidemic of COVID and an epidemic of strokes and cardio uh, and thromboembolic manifestations. Uh, in cases of chemical and thermal eye injury, there is loss of corneal sensation in addition to the exposure and the epithelial loss. In some systemic diseases, diabetes, leprosy, for example, MS, 
long-term contact lens use. What uh, Dr. Amri was talking about is the nerve transaction that occurs with surgeries or with uh, LASIK, uh, abuse of the topical anesthesia, and some uh, anomalies like golden heart where there is congenital trigeminal anesthesia. When there is corneal exposure and diminished or lost corneal sensation, there will be repeated occurrence of spontaneous ulceration and epithelial shutdown. And we need to understand why. Because the nerves, the neural arc from the cornea and the ocular surface is very important for the vitality of the corneal epithelium. Actually, the cornea is the most densely innervated structure in the whole body. It's up to 600 times more sensitive than our normal skin. This is needed because to protect for the blink reflex, for the tearing reflex, but it's also needed for corneal wound healing. Without proper innervation, the epithelium of the cornea gets affected. The, the nerves of the cornea secrete actually epithelial gross factor. And there is a reciprocal, a symbiotic relationship between the corneal epithelium and the nerves. The nerves are needed for the integrity of the corneal epithelium, and then intact epithelium is needed for the proper function of the nerves. So if one of them is affected, the other will get affected immediately. With improper corneal innervation, there will be epithelial breakdown, opacification, and perforation. So the trigeminal nerve, the sensation of the cornea works with the blink response with the facial nerve and works with the autonomic part of the facial nerve for the tearing and the reflex tearing. Both uh, reflex- Dr. Isam, I have one uh, you are muted. You get muted. Can you hear me? Yes. For uh, the, the, the innervation of the cornea is very important for the health of the uh, nerves, and the nerves are very important for the two reflexes, the blink response and the tear secretion. So what we have been doing in the last few years for cases of corneal exposure that are associated with either diminished or absent corneal sensation is that we regain the innervation of the cornea. We do the, the let's say the new or the renovated procedure of corneal neurotization, which means that we bring nerves to re-innervate the cornea. Herpes zoster, herpes simplex are two very great examples of course as well. So in corneal neurotization, we get a nerve graft Sural nerve graft most of the time from the leg. We connect it with innervation from the opposite side most of the time, supra uh, orbital or supratrochlear, and we pass it through the lid and through the upper fornix to re innervate the cornea. Actually, uh, we've been doing this procedure for uh, two or three years now with excellent responses. I, I, I think this procedure deserves a, a special talk on its own. Uh, not just a few minutes, but this is now the uh, best way to manage corneal exposure if associated with diminished or absent corneal sensation. Thank you very much. Chukran Thank you Tomar. very much, Dr. Isam, uh, for this excellent and comprehensive uh, talks and presentation as usual. We are all the time listening for a new and all the time new things from your side. You are every time updating. Uh, there is maybe a question in my colleagues, but uh, let me ask about the last things you are saying about uh, neurotization. Um, I don't know, we get to know that if we cut the nerve, so the nerve is not anymore working uh, and that's why the problems. So how does it happen when you are doing the connections? Uh... Uh, nerve grafts uh, has been uh, now uh, probably in the last 25 or 30 years uh, used in uh, many reconstructive procedures. Uh, some of the long nerves like the Schurer, like the great auricular have the capability uh, if we open the, the, the neurofascicles to regenerate and nerve sprouting 
the nerves will grow like uh, a tree. Uh, and, we, and when we insert these nerve sprouts around the limbus, they actually innervate the, the cornea and invade the periphery of the cornea in a similar fashion to the plexus, limbal plexus that is uh, present. Uh, this can also be helped by nerve growth factors. There are some medicines, uh, even now they can be uh, arranged as eye drops that uh, are nerve growth factors that are used as eye drops that they will fasten this recovery. The recovery of this procedure, the regeneration of corneal nerves takes nine to 12 months. With the use of nerve growth factor, it takes about six months. So uh, things are changing, Dr. Mohammed, as you said. Uh, thank you very much. Is there any question, Dr. Usama, Dr. Safwan, of Mazin, if he's joining us already or not? No, it's, uh, it's, it's very clear. I think it's really, it's a, it's, it's a nice procedure. Uh, I haven't done it myself, but I've seen a few patients here done it abroad and seems yeah. they regain their sensation and uh, it's, it's a helpful. Uh, Dr. Safan? No, there is no comment. It was a very comprehensive uh, uh, talk and very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much. There is a question, Doctor, uh, from here, dear uh, colleagues. Uh, do you perform molar levator recessions? Uh, okay, I'm, actually, I'm typing the answers. Yes. Okay, uh, you want yes, to answer I... it live or you want to answer it? Okay, as okay. you wish. Yes, I do recession, not blepharotomy. I think that recession uh, gives me a, a grading. Blepharotomy will, will have only one uh, uh, result, but uh, doing the recession makes it a gradable procedure, which I, I usually prefer. Uh, okay. Do you Other question is... Yes, please. Do you use infraorbital nerve for neurotization? I don't. Some described using the infraorbital nerve. You have just to make sure that this nerve is still functioning because in many lesions that affects the cornea, sometimes the infraorbital or even the ipsilateral half of the face might also be affected. So I usually go to the supraorbital or supratrochlear of the other That's side. Clear. Okay, I think the last question is here, where do you implant the nerve graft in the affected cornea? Uh, is there any online video for the procedure here, please? Yes, there are a there are couple of online videos for the procedure. We don't implant the nerve grafts in the affected cornea. Uh, some people describe tunneling them in uh, through scleral tunnels into the periphery of the cornea. I don't do this. and. The, the few people that does the procedure, most of them don't do this anymore. You only leave the, the nerves in the perilimbal area under the conjunctiva and they will invade and they will grow through uh, the uh, corneal uh, stroke. How far, Dr. Isham, from the limbal area you, you are leaving? Is there, I mean, one or two millimeter. I don't even, I don't, I don't do periotomy. I keep the, the limbus uh, intact. I, I, we, they, they, they come through the superior fornix and uh, we tunnel them under the conjunctiva uh, at three, six, nine, and 12 clocks around without doing the periotomy. So they are almost one to two millimeter away from the corneal limbs. Thank you very much, Dr. Isam, for this presentation. Uh, thanks a lot. So we can Thank move now to- Muhammad as old as uh, Thank you very much. So now we'll have Dr. Osama al jadi and he is going to give his talk, Dr. Osama. I will try to share. If it's not, I send the lecture there, okay? Okay, if we can stop the, uh, the share of, uh, okay. Already? Yeah, now it will be there. Okay, okay now start from their side. Yes, Osama, I know, but it's that's, now there. But that's yeah. their side, them side, okay? So I'll ask it to no, change the slides, okay? No, no, you can do. Okay, I'll see if it's which. Okay, uh, just go from no. the start. If they don't, they you will do. They will do for you, no problem. You can say. I know that's what I mean. They do it themselves. I don't have control on that screen, by the way. Okay. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Sorry, I couldn't share my screen itself. So thank you, Dr. Mohammed, uh, for the invitation. So I'm just going to talk about recurrent cone erosion. Next slide, please. 
So basically, recurrent coronary erosion can it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it can happen by multiple etiology. It's characterized by inadequate epithelium adhesion uh, and like misadhesion between the epithelium and the Bowman's membrane, and can cause with associated with epithelium defect. Next, please. So it will be two form, either micro erosion, which is really patient complain of mild pain, few few minutes, maybe an hour or something. And then when they come to your clinic, you examine them, you don't find anything. So just people come out in the morning, you feel some pain and severe. That's very mild micro erosion or macro erosion, where people present with severe pain, uh, uh, reduced vision, photophobia. And when they come to you, you examine there's a epithelium defect. Next week, please. So basically, the corneal epithelium is usually it's very firmly adherent to the pomus layer. So it's, there's a there's attachment and they what you call hemidysmosome at the basement layer. Next, please. So it's not simple to slide over and it's, it attaches very well. So the pathogenesis is really it's a, there's a change in adhesion of corneal epithelium either because deficiency in the basement membrane, uh, abnormality in the hemidysmosome or the encartment, the attachment of the fibrils from the epithelium to the bones is not there. Next, please. And that causes the epithelium to not attach it well and causing the erosion. The symptom usually it's presented with pain uh, when the patient, especially when we wake up, they open their eyes, they feel pain. And some people, even in the middle of the night, they, they came with pain. Uh, there's redness, photophobia, watery eye. And people, they become with time, they really, they even scared to open their eyes in the morning because they know when they open their eyes, they will be in and sometimes they just slowly, they open their eyes and moving their eyes before they open it. Next, please. Because really the pains can be very severe and miserable. So it's really one of the painful disease we had in our uh, clinic. Uh, etiology of recurrent coronary erosion, either primary, uh, which is there is a problem with the attached with the membrane, usually the most common cause epithelium-based membrane dystrophy, but it could be with different uh, dystrophy like uh, in the bomus layer, risk buckler dystrophy, lactic degeneration, macular degeneration, and granular degeneration also can cause recurrent cone erosion. Uh, endothelium dystrophy doesn't cause directly, but when they have bullous keratopathy, the bullous can cause recurrent cone erosion. Next, please. But more common is really the secondary one, and the, in particular the trauma. Uh, uh, mainly physical trauma, but even chemical and thermal injury can cause it. Uh, degeneration, band keratopathy, people had sans nodule, uh, little abnormality, uh, entropy, yeah, mectropy, and entropy. Uh, uh, I mean, the مثلا ضارب القطره القرنيه uh, بالقطره شيء من القبيل اللي هو ممكن اللي هو ممكن ان الم فمجرد <تصفيق> وجود <تصفيق> الغواش هذا فد شيء جدا طبيعي ولذلك انا خليتك موعد علي يوم السبت بس تعالي باكر يعني مجرد انه انه مجرد انه انه يعني حتى نتاكد من هذا دكتور صفان ميت يور سيلف sorry for that uh, regarding the refractive surgery is another risk really cause for recurrent core erosion, either LASIK or BRK. Uh, people had the systemic disease like diabetes, bullous, uh, bullous uh, juvenile, they also can have recurrent core erosion because diabetic patients in particular, their epithelium, it tends to be loose, it doesn't heal well, and they tend to have more recurrent core erosion. That's why if you do LASIK, for example, you may have more problems, always recommended maybe to do BRK, especially like a keratome laser, you shouldn't do it with diabetic. Uh, people had the Sika, bullous keratome, the diabetic, all that can cause recurrent cone erosion. Next, please. Uh, the trauma is really the most common cause in our clinic. Almost 45% to 70% of the cases we see uh, with cone erosion because of trauma. The second one is the epithelium based membrane dystrophy is about 10 to 80, 30. And the other dystrophy, uh, that's uh, considered the minority cause for the recurrent cone erosion. Next, please. Uh, trauma, it's as we mentioned, the common cause. If someone had a trauma injury, there's a high chance that they will develop recurrent cone erosion from 5 to 25%. Really, if someone came with me, fresh trauma, I always treat it with a lot of lubricant. I give them ointment at night for a month just because to prevent it, this patient to, to become a chronic recurrent cone erosion. 
Uh, the problem with the trauma, that's it affecting the epithelium, so it prevents the formation of the combination, again, of complex between the bone membrane and the epithelium and, and causing the recurrent cone erosion. Next, please. Regarding the anterior basement, uh, epithelium basement membrane dystrophy, what we call before map dot fingerprint, it's really, it's a, uh, it's batognomic, that's the, there's a problem in the epithelium healing. So this patient, they have problem with the epithelium, the duplication of epithelium healing. So the epithelium doesn't attach it well uh, to the bone layer. It's account 20 to 30%, as we mentioned about recurrent corneal erosion. And usually this patient had the multiple uh, affecting both eyes. So always very important if someone comes to you, you need to examine both eyes and look for this. If there's no clear history of trauma, always look for this one because it's very common and mis misdiagnosis. Next, please. As we say, it's, it, it have different pattern and you could have just like a map dots or what you call fingerprint, depends on the duplication of the base membrane and give you different configuration. Next, please. And for the diagnosis, usually, as I say, for recurrent corneal erosion, patient presented with pain in the morning. I'm not uh, back again, sorry. I had the message different here, Mr. White. So basically, to assist, basically, history is very helpful to diagnose, especially the microscopic recurrent corneal erosion. You don't, we come, patient come to you, you don't see anything. Uh, and not like microscopes. So history, take clear history, uh, ask it about any previous injury. And if it's patient, there's no history of trauma, always make sure you examine the eye very well. To put it fluorescent is very helpful. You could use retroillumination, especially for uh, fingerprint dystrophy, you could see it easy. Next one. Regarding the management, really, it's the most of the patient uh, treated as conservative treatment. Uh, the most common for small cone abrasion, you need to you consider a lot of lubricant, especially nighttime ointment. Always you need to consider. I've seen too many patients, they come and work at cone erosion, they give them artificial deer, they give them just gel at night. You need to consider ointment at night to, to form like a barrier, especially in particular, really, uh, you need to use, consider using sodium chloride 5% ointment uh, at night for a minimum three months. The other ointment available here is Duratir. We are lucky in Moorfield, we had the sodium chloride ointment, as you know, it's not a villain market, but really it's make big difference in the management of this patient. Uh, the ointment advantage is protective like a, as a barrier, so to prevent this to happen, always need to consider artificial tear, better to have preservative free, at least four times, but initially for the first few days, I always give them even hourly, but reduce it after, and you mainly consider prophylactic antibiotic. Next, please. So as I mentioned, 5% sodium chloride is very helpful. It's reduced the epithelium edema, so allow this epithelium to adhere better to the Bowman's layer. But remember, always you need to tell the patient to keep continuous using it for three months. I always tell them, it's just you need to be religious, because what happened with this patient, they feel better after a week or two, and then they stop it and the recurrent attack again and start from zero. Always make sure that they understand you need to carry for a long time, even if there is no symptom, to promote the healing, to be strong before we stop the medication. Next one. Regarding if someone had very large epithelium defect, the option if you had very loose epithelium, it's always better to remove this loose epithelium because it just delay the healing, which, which just with the forceps under slate tab with topical anesthetic. You could consider what you call continuous pressure batching the eyes for a day or three days. And you need to give prophylactic antibiotic. I always give Vigamox because it's preserved free. But really, I have low threshold to use contact lens for this patient because even you batch the eyes, doesn't stop the blinking and doesn't help it, and also the pain. So bandage contact lens really is a very good way. It's relieving the pain immediately, make it much comfortable to the patient because, and prevent this rubbing from the lid over the corneal abrasion, promote the healing. Remember that contact lens, there's a risk of infection, but really it's very, very rare. But definitely, always we need to give uh, antibiotic prophylactic for this patient. And I always try to keep it for two weeks. If I want to keep it longer, I need to change it, the contact lens for the one. Always looking for sign of infiltrate or infection or reaction because that's corneal abrasion can cause secondary infection. You need to look for that. Next one. Next slide, please. Regarding the, you need to treat other associated 
eye disease, in particular dry eye, blepharitis, hygiene, doxycycline, azithromycin. Uh, the good things with doxycycline, it's uh, reduced the collagenase and that promote, uh, help the epithelium to heal is have anti-inflammatory. If there's a cause like abnormality, lead dendrobium, tracheosis, you need to deal with that also. Next one. Regarding artificial tear, as we say, you need to treat the chronic dry eye, always use preservative free. I think always I consider sometimes bunctum blocks because that will help the, to keep the eye more moist. Either you could dissolve the collagen or you could use the silicon for permanent. And if there's a dry eye more, you need to consider anti-inflammatory stays or zidra. And the more severe case, I think autologous serum is very helpful. One of the things that advantage of autologous serum really is very close to the natural eyes. And there's a lot of growth factor help the promote in the healing. Next one. So it's very useful sub, uh, substitute uh, for, for a, a supplement for the eyes, as I mentioned, because there's a vitamin A uh, growth factors. As, as you know, this advantage is it's a bit costly because you need to send to lab to do it. And you always worry about the, the infection and contamination. So always you need to educate the patient how to use it. Next one. The other option is uh, using amniotic membrane, which is uh, had the advantage of anti-inflammatory, anti-scarring, and to promote the healing. It's uh, usually either you could use a brocara wet one, which is like a ring disc with the um, uh, amniotic membrane in it, or you could use the dry, but you need to put the bandage contact over it. Next one. So it's very helpful to promote the healing. Surgical option, uh, deprivement, you could anterior stromal puncture or uh, BTK. Next, please. Regarding the primate, as we said, if there's a loose hanging epithelium, don't leave it because that's just delay the healing. And also it's painful because every time the loose hanging epithelium move, it's, it's causing more pain. So it's, it's just very simple on the slit lamp, just use forceps and, and lose the, remove the loose epithelium. You could use this dry spears and just cotton buds to smoothen it and remove any loose epithelium. Next one. And hopefully we'll remove that to promote the new epithelium to heal better. The other modality, what you call anterior stroma puncture, basically we're using a fine needle, just do multiple puncture in the anterior stroma. We use that when there's a small area of recurrent core erosion, but very important to should be outside the visual axis because that's a stroma puncture causing scar. So you cannot use it in the visual axis. And you're looking for small recurrent core erosion. You could do also what you call diamond bear, using diamond bear, just, just rotating, just basically what you do, you're roughening the Bowman's layer a bit so the epithelium when it's healed back is attached better, anchor that epithelium to the to Bowman's layer to prevent recurrent cornea erosion. Next one. The next modality is the BTK, phototherapeutic keratectomy. BTK has approved by FDA uh, since 1995. It's, uh, it's good when the medical treatment fail. I have many patients come to me because oh, it's the, looking for second opinion. And the uh, doctor advised him to do a laser, but I think many of them really, they, they, they still they haven't never done the full medical treatment. They, especially, as I mentioned, the sodium chloride ointment or any ointment at night. Bef before using that, many patients doesn't settle down and, uh, and uh, some surgeon goes straight to the laser. So laser surgery, BTK, when the medical treatment fail, okay? And uh, that's, that's the step. So I don't do very often of them, because many of my patients really by medical treatment, they, they improve. Uh, you need to do cornea topography to check the cornea thickness. There's the, make sure there's no ectasia. OCT, it's helpful if there's any other pathology that you need to consider for the treatment. You usually need a very low ablation, five to 10 micron only, just roughening into the Bowman's layer with the laser to promote that when the epithelium heal back again, attach it better. And usually it's, it's very useful when they have a, a recurrent core erosion affected the visual axis. And when there's a large area, especially the anterior basement membrane dystrophy, usually is a wider disease. So you, you need to have wider treatment. And the optic zone, you need to include it, the, the area with recurrent erosion. So you could go wider when you need it. And if someone had uh, myobia, for example, you could consider combining the BTK with the BRK. So the patient had two in one. So he, you treat his recurrent core erosion and you do refractive surgery at the same time. You don't need to use metamycin C for this one because the ablation is low. And also you don't want to creating delay healing and dryness more for metamycin C. So I don't use metamycin C 
for anyone due to VTK for recent con erosion. Next one. But always remember when you do BTK, always I'll tell the patient that you need to carry with the medication, the ointment also still we need to carry with it. Uh, in conclusion, recant corneal erosion is very common. We're facing every day in our clinic uh, from our, our referral. Uh, trauma is the, is the common cause. The second one is anterior base membrane dystrophy. So you, you need to look for this one. Uh, patient education is very important. You need to tell the patient, we need to treat it with lubricant ointment for longer periods. So to, and that's very important. And also treat, if there's any dry eye, you need to treat that one. As I say early, medical treatment, majority of the patient, that's enough. And you don't need to do surgery, but if persisted, then you need to consider anterior stroma puncture, BTK, which is very helpful, and the, the risk is very low. Thank you. Next one. And thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Osama, for this an excellent and comprehensive. I think this topic needs itself a, a session on more than one session. But yeah. uh, anyway, I'll highlight most of the point. Uh, if there is any question from uh, here, colleagues, Dr. Safan, Dr. Mazen, now he is already with us, or oh, Dr. Isam. Yes. Dr. Mohammed, just allow me. Dr. Osama, it was a comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. Uh, great thanks for you. Uh, usually yeah. an excellent presentation. Uh, the only point is that, as you mentioned, for the ointment, it's not uh, always available. And I do agree with you, sodium hyaluronic. Sodium chloride, 5%. Uh, it's an important uh, use of uh, ointment. But when it's uh, missed uh, from the market, I, I don't know why it's missed from the market. In your site, your luxury site, uh, in, in your pharmacy, uh, private pharmacy, you have the sodium chloride, 5%. If we don't have, I'm using the ointment with carbomere. So any ointment with carbomere can, can do the same. That's right. It's not uh, dehydrate the epithelium or reduce the the uh, size of the, of the or the volume of the epithelium, but it can uh, do it. Uh, second issue is that when you need to when we need to do a puncture for the stroma, uh, that's right. We can use the needle, but we can use also the YAG laser. I'm using the YAG laser personally uh, on the surface, especially as you said that it's it's away from the uh, visual axis and it's do a very uh, uh, helpful uh, uh, tool. And great thanks for you. You're going for more expensive. That's why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. That is sure. much a simpler achievement people, to do with the uh, needle. People, they're afraid from the needle, Osama. Yeah, and maybe, yeah, I don't okay. know, in your area, yeah. maybe the people, they are not afraid no. from the from no, the puncture. Just, uh, Needle, uh, the needle. Our you could bend the needle a yeah. bit. You could use like a sister term, so you bend the tip That's of right. the needle, so you're not worried about it. And mm. really, you could use diamond bear, so you could use I'm using a diamond for him. So is the diamond maybe better? I'm not yeah. sure which is more cheaper, diamond or, uh, or the laser. But no, yeah, laser is more option. cheaper. <laughs> mm. Anyway. Fair enough. Uh, regarding the okay, Dr. Dura, Mazen, ointment, you it's better to use the ointment anyway. So it's better yeah. to use even here if you don't have sodium chloride ointment. By the way, welcome any patient if you want to have, come to our clinic, yeah. we'll give him the sodium chloride time. ointment. Great There's time. no problem. <laughs> mm. uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Mazen, if you have any question or a comment. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for this nice session, Dr. Uh, Lamri, for uh, this invitation. Uh, actually, um, uh, I would ask, uh, of course, uh, all presentations were uh, very nice. I would ask Dr. Safwan, uh, when you do the uh, YAG laser, uh, what are the settings that you are using, you are using for the uh, recurrent corneal erosion? No, the, the setting is that, uh, first of all, the, the, you need to ask in, 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 in different ways. What's the power that we are using for, for, uh, the, uh, uh, for that side? I'm, I'm reducing the power to around 1 uh, uh, or, or uh, 1 1.5 uh, millijoule. That's, that's what I'm using. The same setting as the posterior capsular or anterior capsular inflammatory, but I'm yeah. you're reducing the power to the power that it can create only a, a rough uh, uh, photo disruption uh, effect on the surface of the stroma. So you do this after removal of the epithelium? It, the epithelium is removed. It's the, we have, you have a, a recurrent corneal erosion. You have an erosion. So you need to, no, to uh, create sometimes... a rough roughing of the, of, the epithelium, of the stromal surface, of the Bowman's membrane. Great. You are going now, to do uh, well, sometimes we have the. Are you going to do in the center if the center? Sorry, Dr. Mazen. 
uh, are you going to use the, the YAG laser in the center, in the visual axis? No, no. No, I'm, I said that except it, if it is in the visual axis, not in the visual, because yeah. it's creating a scar. There will but be yeah, a scar on that's it. That's why yani if, if, if the erosion in the center. If the erosion in the center, then the, that's all. I, we, we, will, we will go ahead. We will not, I will not do it. I will go to, to, do, to the PTK. Okay. Uh, sorry, Dr. Madden, I interrupt you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, great. So uh, if we have the map dot fingerprint uh, dystrophy, so um, without, let's say the patient came to us without erosion. So in this case, we have to debride the, the epithelium and apply the YAG laser. We cannot no, apply the YAG laser area. under the epithelium. I don't know, but that's uh, anterior base membrane dystrophy. That's a wider disease. So you cannot do that. You have to do laser BTK because it's a diffuse okay. uh, disease. Because we'll have a okay. the visual access. I had one uh, question no, there for the... Yeah, sorry, I yes. have uh, some questions. I will ask you, Dr. Osama, this one. If there is yeah. a recurrent corneal erosion in the myopic patient, do you advise PRK to the treat the erosion? He, told, he said and... that. Yeah, basically, okay. I've seen the question. First of all, there's two things. Uh, BRK, can we do BRK only without BTK? Yes. But that depends in the optic zone. So if it depends where the recurrent corneal erosion. So if it's recurrent corneal erosion uh, involved in the optic zone treatment, yes, definitely. Yeah. But we don't do trans-BRK for this patient. You need to remove the epithelium and do BTK. So you don't do the trans-BRK for people who had recurrent corneal erosion, BRK. So you remove the epithelium manually. And that's removing the manual also is very helpful, by the way, because you yeah. know the extent of the disease also. And you don't use alcohol for this patient because also it helps you to, with the sponge to see where's the disease, how much wider, because you could, when you start to remove the epithelium, if it's loose far, you may do BTK much wider. And you could do BRK over, but if it's BRK optic zone covering the recurrent erosion area, just do the BRK. But why not a trans PRK, Osama? No, because the epithelium is, there's no point because you need to assess the epithelium looseness also. So it's a good yeah. chance to touch it and see how much they're losing epithelium. But if someone had a specifically trauma injury and the epithelium very smooth, it's fair enough. But the epithelium is this one who had the corrosion center. The epithelium is not smooth, as good as you wanted. And then better to remove it manually to have better refractive mm -hmm. result than to do trans-BRK. There's no benefit to anyway, trans-BRK in this case. Anyway. OK, yeah. Usama, uh, can you uh, please uh, answer the last question? How many spots do you use? There's no spot, by the way. It's just you need to, the, the BTK, you're using for the depth. So five micron to 10 micron. OK. Uh, I think there is optic zone. OK, if you allow me, there is two questions just from the beginning. I didn't uh, notice them. Uh, do you recommend relief total care eye drops for frequent use in keratorefractive uh, patients? Uh, yes, as, as far as I know. And the question, the second one, do you perform? Oh, no, there is another one, sorry. Um, can we advise the drops to use in the contact lens? Yes, it can be used uh, in the contact lens mirror. And uh, it will take, even if there is a yellow spot, it will not stay in the uh, contact lens. Okay. So now we will move to our dear Dr. Safwan to start his talk. Please, Dr. Safwan, the mic is your place. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for Dr. Mohamed Al-Amri to give me this uh, opportunity to uh, discuss how to prevent and manage persistent epithelial defect post-PRK. Now, uh, we are all knows that uh, we had some cases after PRK that persist, uh, the epithelial persist defect, and uh, we end up with a, a superficial scar or uh, 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 an infection. So, uh, in my opinion, is that we need to go through and uh, prevent that. And uh, uh, with the with the new generations of the machines, they have some tools and some modalities that it can reduce the uh, a lot of factors that it will interfere with the healing of the uh, uh, epithelium or reepithelization. Before that, let's go to what we call uh, how the uh, re-epithelization happens in an uh, epithelial defect. So uh, basic epithelial cells at the wound margin will be flattened, mobilization, that's what we call, 
and migrate into the open wound. And that's shown in the upper picture. Then the second is the horizontal mitotic or horizontal direction uh, uh, epithelization. And basal, ba ba uh, basal cell at margin multiply mitosis in a horizontal direction. And the third way is the basal cell behind my, uh, margin undergo vertical growth uh, differentiation. Now, let's uh, uh, define what we call or what's the definition of what we call, uh, uh, just if you allow me the, uh, to, <clears throat> what's the meaning of the persistent uh, epithelial defect? So failure of reutilization beyond 10 days up to three weeks we, uh, and after PRK, this is what we, what we can define generally and what's published as a persistent epithelial defect, usually lead to scarring of corneal stroma underlying, and that's what we are, or to infection. So what, that's what we are afraid from. And uh, 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 the scar will even, will, will happen even if the epithelium subsequently heal. Persistent PED in corneal result in development of uh, myofibroblast and uh, uh, disordered extracellular matrix produced by these cells that together can create opacity within and short distance beyond the, uh, the PED. Clinician should treat the PED within 10 days of non-closure of epithelium to facilitate epithelial healing to prevent long-term stromal scarring. If we will go to measures how we can prevent or what's the causal story behind the PRK or in the PRK that delay the epithelization? Few of them, uh, Dr. Osama mentioned it. Uh, laser energy. Now, the amount of the laser that we apply, the type of that laser, the spot size, the spot shape, the, uh, the technology behind the, the spots and the energy and the way of the fluence of this energy as a first phase and, and the last phase, all it's a play a role in uh, 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 applying that energy amount on the stroma. And definitely we, we will have uh, the higher the energy, the, the higher the inflammation. The use of mitomycin C, that one of the causes of de delaying that create delaying in the uh, epithelial healing. The irregular stromal surface, and that also be, be behind the laser, the modality of the laser, the flow of the laser, the parallel modes of the laser with, with the round spot or with the pattern or with that we called it parallel comparing to the hexagonal pattern. Use of alcohol to remove uh, corneal epithelium. Irregular outer margin of the uh, deep fertilization when we are removing removing it uh, manually. All these factors um, play a role in, in uh, delaying according to the size of the optical zone, definitely, the amount of the alcohol comparing to the brush, uh, the, ir the irregularity of the stromal surface, and that's my subject now to, to discuss it uh, uh, upon with the use of mitomycin C and the laser energy. Now, if we will go to how to prevent, then now, for those that they have a classical uh, laser energy and then the classical way, so use of the chills BSS, I think that it's a, it's a play a very good role in reducing the stromal inflammation and uh, at the end of the day, gives the chance to the epithelial migration and proliferation and differentiation and mitosis in a better way. For and. Related to the mitomycin C, uh, there is a, a, a very famous uh, published study that shows that uh, each 50 micron of ablation uh, should have 50 second uh, mitomycin C exposure of 0.02, so uh, concentration. And that through this, this study, they shown that with this uh, 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 equation, 50 micron ablation, 50 second uh, mitomycin C, they uh, had the lowest delay in uh, uh, reutilization and the lowest uh, 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 haze or, or the corneal scarring. So it, 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 it's a very therapeutic, uh, non-toxic. 
means that they got the therapeutic eff uh, uh, effect of mitomycin C in reducing the, the haze and the scar and, uh, and the, the best uh, 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 equation to reduce the epithelial delay. Now, related to the irregularity of the stromal surface after the uh, uh, ablation and the use of alcohol in uh, removal of the epithelialization and regular outer margin, uh, the technology here, it's uh, an important way. That's why I prefer more of my cases doing the PRK to do, to do it in the new way. It's the trans epithelial. The trans epithelial PRK, here we are using the laser to remove the epithelium. And when we are talking about trans epithelial, we are not talking about uh, 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 an, an, a measurement to the epithelium by the uh, anterior OCT to see the exact epithelium and measure it. And then this is an equation that we found that the use of 55 central and 65 periphery in, in this uh, trans epithelial, we will remove more than 96 or 97 percent, and what's remain, would, it will not affect the refractive outcome. Because when we are saying that this epithelium, as the, my discussion with Dr. Osama, when we are saying that this epithelial part is, it's not uh, a uniform, or uh, there is an, for example, the central was 60 instead of 55 or 50 instead of 55, then uh, the, the result of five micron uh, uh, under or over will create in our measurement less than 0.25, and that will not affect the, uh, the uh, uh, final outcome. So transepithelial, the laser will be applied directly on the cornea, and the margin of it will be uniform, not irregular, and we will not use alcohol or brush. Here, the, uh, the, the, in, 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 in the technology that present here in two company, I don't have any financial enclosure in any product present here. Uh, uh, one of them using a refractive mode first and then followed by a PTK. The other one using PTK followed by a refractive mode. This is a, a, a manufacturing uh, uh, technique. But at the end of the day, we are measuring al algorithmically uh, the amount that we, are, we need to remove. And then uh, 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 considering the epithelium in the center in, in, my techno in the te technology of the machine that I'm using, uh, they consider the central epithelium as a 55 and the peripheral epithelium as a 65. So here it gives us the uh, 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 advantage of uh, 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 getting rid of the uh, alcohol or brush and the regularity of the, mar of the outer margin. Now, if we need to talk about the uh, regularization of the uh, surface, then we will, we will go to talk about the smart pulse technology. That's all the talk that I, I uh, uh, show it in, in, in my uh, discussion earlier. Now, the pattern of the spot, so the spot of the laser that in a regular machines that present in the market is in the parallel way, not in the hexagonal way. Now, what we are applying, I think that in the second slide here, I'm, I'm sure on the left side, you can see that what, we, what I mean by the parallel spot. The spot is a round spot. But when we need to tr treat a one millimeter square, we need five spot, not a four spot. Because, because if we will use four spot, we will have an island in the center. And that's what we mean by the, the, the uh, smoothness of the surface. <clears throat> if we will use five spot, then the central spot and the, with the islands, it will create some irregularity and the surface will be harsh. Comparing to the right picture, you can see the hexagonal, which, which shows a mimic to the ball, to the football, where the spot will be in a hexagonal uh, form. And that hexagonal form will cover the one millimeter with a four spot without islands in between. And that makes the surface of the cornea more smooth and gives 
a good chance for the uh, epithelium to heal in a quick way. So we can imagine how the epithelium, it's uh, as uh, people running in, on a circle in, in the periphery, the whole the people, they will run to one uh, spot in the center. So if they have a hills in front of them, they need to climb that hills and the epithelium, they are not climbing, they are increasing in the depth to reach the surface of the hill and then continue. So, and that's what, what, what we mean by remodeling. So the remodeling, because the, the, the epithelium have the ability to model, and that would delay the re -epithelization. So the, the, the smoother the surface, the better the, uh, 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 the time of the epithelization. And that's what we uh, uh, saw. In, in our machine. First of all, a very good rate of epithelization, which reached to a re less than three days, less pain. And the, the other issues is that the very smooth surface in a way that a uh, few patients that they went to test with the other doctors, they've been informed that there is no laser applied until they did a corneal map and they saw that there is um, uh, the uh, flattening and steepening on the cornea the result uh, related to the type of the laser that we did. And that's a microscopical picture shows clearly on the right side, uh, the uh, smart pulse uh, technology using uh, trans epithelium and on the right side is the classical uh, 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 pattern with the uh, uh, mechanical removal of the epithelium. On a conclusion, the use of this technology, uh, which will enhance and prevent any delay in the epithelization and gives a better chance to uh, have a better outcome uh, and quicker uh, 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 result and uh, uh, shortening the time of pain that followed by uh, a PRK resulted from the delay of the epithelization. Usually if you compare between alcohol, not a brush, brush may be better, alcohol and uh, smart pulse, you, you can find that there is a difference of around five days to six days. And it's, uh, sorry, it's very accurate in dealing with all uh, 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 irregularities in a, in a, in a uh, precise way, especially when we are using it, treating uh, as a uh, trans-PRK for uh, uh, astigmatism and the treatment uh, of the high order of patients. Now, we will go to the, how to manage the delay if it's happened, uh, apart from the, all these factors that, we, that I mentioned. As we know, and Osama mentioned a few of them, uh, an aggressive lubrication, a discontinuation of a medication that has a preservative material, and I'm using, um, and especially when, when I have it, punctal occlusion directly because just to increase the lubrication because the tear film having all the factors that enhance the re bandage soft contact lens, one of my modalities, debridement for any uh, margin irregular that can uh, uh, interfere with the, with the healing. So I'm, I'm removing those margins from the, uh, uh, from the uh, area of, or the border of the, of the defect. Now, tarsorafi, I don't think so that now anyone using it. Now they are using uh, Botox in, instead of tarsorafi and tarsorafi uh, as a concept, closing the, the uh, palpebral fissure. It can, for a one day or two days or three days, it can give a, a good chance for a persistent healing. Tetracycline used with, it, with its beneficial as an anti-collagenase activity uh, I'm, I personally, I didn't reach to this state to use uh, uh, tetracycline, but uh, it's been used and it's using for those that they have some uh, uh, de defect that may be delayed more than two, two weeks. Now, if we will go to a new therapy, I think that uh, Dr. Mazen will, will have um, uh, more details on, on them. Uh, but I will mention in them uh, the use of amniotic, and, and it's been mentioned by Dr. Osama, amniotic membrane as a grafting, and he shows the two way of either by contact lens or by dry th that we need to add a contact lens on it. Autologous serum, 
and uh, we are preparing it in the in the uh, using the serum from centrifuge and uh, using it uh, uh, with the uh, with the the serum of the what, from the person limbal stem cell transplantation that's one of the modalities in case of a persistent beyond the uh, uh, maybe one month i think that Osama have a good experience with it i i didn't have and i didn't do it what's in the in the uh, pipeline for a topical, and that's what uh, I'm concerned about it. And uh, I'm, I'm looking for all the, the modalities that appear and all the studies that shows any uh, uh, material that will be as a drops that we can, in, that it can enhance the reutilization. And I think Mohammed Al Amri, he talked about the, uh, the new medication that will be registered in, in, uh, in UAE that will. Uh, carry the, the ability to reutilization. One of its the one of these studies shows that the fibronectin uh, 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 play a good role in reutilization, and still it's in the in the study form. And the thymosine beta uh, four, and this diagram shows the uh, the effect of uh, thymosine beta four on the uh, uh, mitotic activity and it's a promoting epithelial cell migration, decrease inflammation, decrease uh, the MMP uh, expression and matrix de uh, degradation and decrease uh, chem uh, chemokines production. So by it, it's reduced the, the inflammation and increase the migration and mitosis, my mitotic activity of the, uh, of the epithelial cell. Nexagon, an active ingredient in topical nexagon. Also, it's uh, in in certain way. It's in uh, that's the third material. It increase, reduce the inflammation and increase the epithelial uh, 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 migration and uh, 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 mitotic activity. These studies shows. Uh, this is a series of studies having each, each one shows certain material that increase the utilization. And this, a summary of this material is the aloe vera gel, topical insulin, topical amino caproic acid, aqueous extract of uh, Santilla uh, asiatica, topical uh, cryopreserved uh, amniotic membrane. Those material and uh, Prefenoid, pre, uh, don nanoparticles. These, these studies, they, they did it on the animals and now it's, it's, in, in, it's in, in their trials, final trials on the human being. And it shows all of them a very encouraging uh, 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 result to in increase and enhance the reutilization especially the topical insulin, where I'm, 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 I'm following the old studies and the results that uh, on it, uh, because it's, uh, it will be uh, uh, an important factor. Still, it, the, the mechanism, how insulin as a topical uh, 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 form, it enhance the uh, reutilization. It's not, understand, not understandable, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it shows a more encouraged uh, figures than the others in reutilization. What's available in our market, I think that Dr. Mohammed Al Amri talked about the relief total care with its uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, effect. I'm personally now using a Ricu gel to enhance the reutilization, but unfortunately that we are we are not able to use to use it with the contact lens. So we are waiting for uh, the. Uh, uh, that the epithelium to, to be covered and then or means that the fluorescence should be negative. And then we are, then I, I I, I'm, I'm able to use the Ricogel. Till now, I didn't have any answer why I'm not able to use the Ricogel with the contact lens. I love it as a drops. I can use it and I'm using it with the, with the, uh, with the contact lens and it shows uh, uh, a good effect for uh, reutilization. Uh, Hopefully that I will use the relief total care and uh, see a, a much much better result for the reutilization. Great thanks for all.
thank you very much, my dear friend Safwan. This is also a very nice and excellent presentation, comprehensive. Um, there is a lot of details. If there is any question from Dr. Osama or Dr. Isam also, uh, if you are there, Dr. Isam with us. Yes, uh, I'm comment? there. Okay, no. if you have any question to Dr. Safwan or comment. No, I haven't that. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, one thing uh, about, uh, I had one patient a few months ago. Uh, I usually give Navinac or, Ac or Acular after post BRK, just for two days, okay? And that patient, he had after a week, there's a, uh, there's a petelium defect, but this is the, the problem. Sometimes he overusing using the Navinac and keep using it for longer time. And it's very important to understand the patient history and medication because that could be a reason why he had this persistent epithelium defect. So it's very important and also preservative, very important to make sure the patient not a preservative, but uh, the, make sure that what he's using, the medication doesn't delay his epithelium to heal. Yeah, I just need to, to, to reply for that. Yes, I, I do agree with you. Uh, usually, Usama, you know that we are not using Daclofenac sodium as a drops. Um, I'm, 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 uh, uh, I'm taking the contact lens and putting it, uh, removing the fluid from it and putting uh, daclofenac sodium uh, and uh, dry it first and then putting it in the daclofenac sodium for a while of time. And this is a study for Hafizi and, and uh, uh, I think that there is another study shows that the, when that contact lens uh, absorb the daclofenac sodium, the amount of the daclofenac sodium that will go to the con dried, dried contact lens uh, it's enough to keep the cornea uh, 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 painless or keep the patient painless for at least 24 to 48 hours, which is the important uh, time for the uh, reducing all the pain. So I'm, I'm very happy with it, really. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think there is one thing, Dr. Safan, you mentioned regarding the uh, relief total care. It's already registered available, so it's available now. It's in hopefully UAE. that I will use it. Hopefully I they start will bring with it this one with some medications actually, mm. uh, but still we are waiting for the result, and we hope it will be encouraging. Um, I think the Dr. Mazen he have uh, some uh, um, something that he cannot continue, and he. Apologize that he will not give us uh, his talk presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. We apologize for our uh, participants for that. Uh, I think we we get to the end of the our session. If, if there is any things before we move or we conclude our sessions, Dr. Sama, Safwan, and Dr. Hassan. Well, I think that there is a few questions, Dr. Uh, uh, Muhammad. If they are they are uh, asking for the. How long that does it take for preparation for the uh, autologous? That's right. Yes, that's one question. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, for for us, for me, I'm using it as preparation for a drops, and I'm putting it in the drops. And uh, uh, for me, uh, every 48 hours, I'm I'm changing them. Uh, if the patient can come daily, I can I can use it for 24 hours, and I can uh, return it back. Uh, to change it because it's uh, there is no preservation in it that, and uh, uh, it's only the the serum and uh, how many times well I'm using it for at least for every four hours and it's very helpful really I have one time I, one time that I have a persistent beyond uh, three weeks and I end up with the uh, amniotic membrane uh, but it's helpful at least in reducing the the, the size of the uh, of the defect so I'm using uh, it for four to five times. I think, Dr. Yeah, Safan, that, yeah. you prepare in your clinic. There is a special. No, no, no. I'm, I'm sending the patient to the lab. They lab, are doing yes. centrifuging, and they are present. Okay. They give, uh, bring me the the serum. Okay, it can yes. be valid for for four days, even sometimes, right? Well, for me, I'm I'm I, I, I'm sorry that I, 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 I I'm afraid from any contamination because I I'm, I don't know the patient how they how they are dealing with the tips of the of the drops. So I'm removing yeah. all the artificial tear and uh, keeping it in the, in the same drops. Uh, uh, so I prefer uh, uh, for a maximum 48 hours, two days, instead of four days. Uh, that's for more secure. Uh, we're using much longer, really. For us, it's just we do the same. 
with, uh, we send it to the lab and then we bring it, the pharmacy prepare it under yes. a clear sterile area. Unprepared. And then we use the bottle, the pharmacy yeah. prepare it in. And then, then the bottle, we keep it for a week to use really. And that's the other one, that's in the fridge. You have to keep in the fridge. But yes. the remaining one, we give it to put in the freezer. And it yeah, that's the remaining. Months, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so I'm, 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 I'm keeping need... the remaining. I'm, I'm saying that the patient will come one week, and if he can come every two days, I will change it. I will take from the fridge and change it just for yeah, but, security. Uh, yeah. But we give it to the patient. We give it to the patient to keep it with his freezer. Really, we don't give it stock to ourselves. So we give mm -hmm. them the bottle, like five bottles, six bottle, and then he carry using it. The yeah, one he yes. using put in the fridge, and the other one put yeah, in the that, freezer. That you, are, yeah, you are just dividing it and put. Yeah, we, it we give it to him, and then he for, will uh, manage it himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's another uh, another way. Uh, I think uh, we there is any other questions, Dr. Safan? You can see because you want well, to I'm answer how many spot of your laser. I think you you mentioned that, right? Yeah. How many, one question sorry. there, how, how do you modify how, how steroid use in modify steroid the system yeah. defect? Okay. How do you more modify the steroid and what, sorry? In, in the persistent uh, effect, yeah. Okay. Now, the, the, there is a lot of controversy for the use of steroid here. And the steroid in a persistent defect means that we were using a classical way of treatment. Uh, in 100%, in, uh, I'm, I'm using steroid for, for those all uh, post-trans PRK, and I'm using it in the same way. But once patients coming after five days to remove the bandage contact lens, and I have a defect, still, I hear I start to reduce the steroid. I'm, I'm, for example, if I will use it four times daily, I will reduce it to two times, especially when the stroma is normal, there is no any inflammation in the stroma. And then I will wait for another two days to, to see whether the epithelium is uh, uh, the, the defect is uh, uh, healed, then I will return back to the same frequency of the steroid. So the controversy here, whether we are using that, it's not in the effect of the steroid on the reptilization, but in the effect of whether we will use steroid to reduce the stromal inflammation and enhance reptilization uh, uh, in uh, a persistent defect. So that's why uh, when we are seeing the, the persistent defect for two, three days, it's no matter that to reduce the epithelium to enhance uh, or accelerate the epithelialization. But when we have a persistent more than two weeks and we have stromal inflammation, 100% we need the steroid here to reduce the inflammation. Yeah, it's a balance, I think. It's the only yeah, thing that's, different, that balance I, 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 change a, it, I change it to preserve it free straight away. There's, yes, I always yeah. use a preserve that's for free sure. But yeah. uh, but uh, you need to control the inflammation. This is to stop the steroid completely. That's the wrong way also because yes, exactly. the inflammation also delay the healing. So it's, you exactly. need to judge it. Uh, you need low dose of steroid definitely, but not never stop it. Exactly. Okay. I think uh, uh, we have uh, come to the end of this session. I would like to thank you all. To thank Dr. Isam for his time and being with us. Dr. Isam and Dr. Safan. And also great thanks to our dear Dr. Mazen. He has some uh, things that you need to do and that's why he apologized to continue. Uh, I would like to thank you all attendees for being with us today with this. I know this topic, it needs more than one session, but this time we just highlight certain points. Maybe in future we can split, we can have one time about recurrent corneal erosion for more details and so on. Uh, also, the certificate of attendance, it will be, there will be an email sent to you by the link. You can just click that link, use the same um, uh, email that you use for register, then you can fill the certificate or the certificate of attendance. Uh, at the end, also, I'd like to remind you all that we are going to have our uh, seventh quick uh, passing ophthalmology international conference on 10 to 12 of uh, February in a virtual platform and we are having a very nice and highly uh, uh, well and organized scientific program with very eminent speakers, more than 150 uh, international speakers with a three parallel, uh, will be, we will have three parallel uh, uh, sessions running at the same times. So with a great uh, distribution of the speaker in all subspecialties. Uh, thank you for all of you. Thank you also for uh, 
Savit for sponsoring this company and Megagate and for their support in this meeting. Uh, at the end, we'd like to thank you all. Thanks to our management event and see you. Goodbye. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.